Former Illinois Congressman Joe Walsh is now challenging President Trump for the Republican nomination. Walsh represented Chicago's northern suburbs for the last two years of Barack Obama's first term. The Tea Party member regularly promoted conspiracy theories about President Obama's citizenship. In 2017, Walsh wrote Obama was held to a lower standard because he is black. Walsh endorsed President Trump in the 2016 election and told ABC News Sunday he actually feels partially responsible for his victory. I helped create Trump. And George, that's not an easy thing to say. I, uh, look, we were divided before Trump. I went to Washington eight years ago. The part of the Tea Party class wanted to, to shake Washington up. I got involved in the battles, and there were plenty of times where I went beyond the policy and the idea differences, and I got personal, and I got hateful. I said some ugly things about President Obama that I regret, and, and it's difficult, but I think, I think that helped create Trump. Um, and I feel responsible. We have a guy in the White House who's never apologized for anything he's done or said. I, I think it's a weakness not to apologize. I've, I, helped, I helped create Trump. There's no doubt about that. The personal ugly politics, I regret that, and I'm sorry for that. CBSN political reporter Caitlin Huey Burns is now here to discuss. Caitlin Walsh is now the second Republican to launch a campaign against Trump. Why does he feel like he is the right person to do it? Well, you heard him kind of describe in that interview that he believes that uh, he needs to take this step. Uh, he is a former Tea Party congressman, and because he said in his words he helped create Trump, he knows how to defeat him or at least should try. It's Certainly an uphill battle, though. Uh, the president is very popular among Republicans. Poll after poll shows his support uh, nearing 80 percent, sometimes higher. Uh, the RNC, the Republican National Committee, and Donald Trump's campaign have joined forces very early on to shore up his support, especially in those early primary and caucus states. So the campaign has taken steps to kind of push a challenger away, uh, and they're also pretty confident that given the president's support among Republicans, Republicans that he's just not ripe for a challenge. And you know, you mentioned the polls. The Associated Press this week found that 79% of Republicans approve of the job President Trump is doing. So what voters are, is he going after? Well, there is uh, this contingent uh, that some in the party or some former Republicans uh, kind of described as never Trumpers, but it remains to be seen how active and influential that contingent really is beyond interviews on cable news and um, kind of making uh, headlines about this. Um, the Republican, the base of the Republican Party is very firmly behind Trump, and we see that in polls and also in our reporting on the ground. Uh, there is some vulnerability, of course, for the president, given that his approval ratings overall are low, and uh, Walsh was actually asked about, you know, whether this would uh, fuel the Democratic uh, nominee, the eventual nominee, and he said that this is a step that he feels like he needs to take. He's not the only one. Bill Weld, of course, the former Massachusetts governor, is also in this race, but hasn't been able to really gain any traction. Speaking about gaining traction, let's go ahead and jump to the 2020 candidates as far as the Democratic side is concerned. We've lost uh, Washington Governor Jay Inslee, Massachusetts Congressman Seth Moulton, they ended their campaigns a little abruptly. We saw climate change was Inslee's really go-to topic. It's really popular with voters. Why don't you think he got any traction? Well, what we're seeing in this campaign is that even though voters are really concerned about climate change, about health care, about the economy, about their wages, they are prioritizing defeating Donald Trump as their top concern. So even if they care about a lot of these issues, they're not necessarily backing a single issue candidate. That's one element. Another element to consider is that it's been very difficult this cycle for governors, current and former governors, uh, to make way, make their way through this primary so far. And that's because this has really seemed to be a really nationalized campaign. So where governors were able to kind of make their mark in their states, it's much more difficult now to kind of translate that nationwide in terms of polling, but also in terms of raising money. Well, because of that fact and maybe other as well. Do you think any other candidates are soon to fall? Well, that's what we're watching over the next 48 hours, really, because the deadline for making this next debate in September
September is this Wednesday, and so there's a certain threshold that they need to meet uh, in polling and donor requirements. There are several candidates who have not yet made that debate stage. There are 10 uh, who have, so that could have a real winnowing effect and cause some of these campaigns to really evaluate their future. Let's talk about some of the events that we saw happen over the weekend. We've been following Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren. She then held one of her uh, rallies. It was the largest rally of her campaign in Seattle Sunday, her team is saying. Mm -hmm. And when we look at some of the numbers, we reflect back to 2016. Mm -hmm. Bernie Sanders had similar numbers and then lost the nomination to Hillary Clinton. So mm -hmm. what would you say is the takeaway from Warren's rally as we look at those numbers? Right, it's a good perspective to have. I think what's different, though, in this race is that there are so many candidates vying for attention. The idea that one candidate is able to draw this kind of crowd, and she drew about 12,000 in Minnesota recently, uh, I think is significant. Now, the Warren team said that this is because she is building a movement, and she said over the weekend that her campaign, it's not enough to just say you want to not be Trump. It's uh, more about having a, a vision for the future, and she sure, certainly has that with her policy plans. Now, that was kind of a subtle swipe at Joe Biden, who has been trying to make the case that he is the reliable choice, the steady choice, the, the kind of safe bet, so to speak, um, or other campaigns have been calling him, that um, he is the best equipped to defeat Donald Trump. So you're seeing kind of these two campaigns operate very differently. It's interesting to hear you say that because Joe Biden had to defend some of the rallies he mm -hmm. held this weekend with just a couple of hundred people showing up. Right. He talked about the size of where he was compared mm -hmm. to where Warren was. Uh, and then Politico this morning drew a comparison between Warren's rallies and what they called subdued events with attendees numbering the hundreds. So what would you say as far as stages of their campaign? Right. Well, they have two very different goals. Joe Biden ha is running as uh, someone who can restore what he says is the moral clarity of this nation, re re return, um, the, you know, this is a battle for the soul of the nation. Elizabeth Warren is arguing to, to shake things up, to go big and to go bold on these big uh, policy agenda items that she has. So two very different ways of looking at this presidential race. I've attended rallies on both sides, and they are very different. Joe Biden's campaign events are smaller town halls, uh, kind of targeted in, in areas that he needs to turn out voters. Uh, on the other hand, he doesn't have to really boost his name ID. Most voters know who he is. He's leading in the polls. Uh, Elizabeth Warren, though, has been waging a slow but steady race, um, and she is the one out of all the candidates who have been consistently gaining ground. So certainly something that the Biden campaign has to be on the lookout for. We saw that uh, Bernie Sanders was out as well. He was in mm -hmm. Louisville, Kentucky, and of course he was speaking to uh, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell's hometown of mm -hmm. Louisville, and he took some knocks at him. What do you have to say? He did. Well, this is an interesting strategy, really, to go literally to Mitch McConnell's backyard and slam the Senate Majority Leader. He and lots of Democrats believe this, that McConnell has been standing in the way of Democratic priorities. He urged uh, McConnell to just take up a uh, vote or to have votes on items, especially on the issue of guns. And I think this is what you might start to see from some of these candidates figuring out ways to uh, go after Mitch McConnell and try to keep the issue, especially on guns, at the forefront, because this is an issue that resonates really with a lot of voters increasingly concerned about it and something that Democrats have kind of struggled to make a single issue. All right, so much more to come. Far yeah. from over. <laughs> Caitlin Huey Burns, thank you so much for joining thank us. You.